Alright, so in this video we're going to take a look at damping and resonance. Um, so before we get started, um, some of the terminology I'm going to be using in this video. So when I talk about free vibration, what I'm talking about is a system that's oscillating and it's not transferring any energy to the surroundings. So in the case of most oscillators, the surroundings would be the air surrounding your system. Um, so if we say have a pendulum, it means it's not doing any work against friction or air resistance. All of the energy is staying in the system as either potential or kinetic energy. And the opposite of that would be damped vibration. So what this means is you are doing some work against external forces, so um, air resistance or friction at a pivot point maybe with a pendulum, and that's reducing the total energy in the system. So the potential energy and the kinetic energy or the mechanical energy, to use the proper term for those combined, is being transferred out of the system of your pendulum or your spring. And then we're going to talk about this idea of force vibration, which is essential when we talk about resonance. And it's essentially when you have some sort of periodic force. So it's not a constant force, so it's not just like 10 newtons, but it's a periodic force. So it's some kind of sine wave or cosine wave, that kind of thing. And it's being applied to a system. So something like being applied to a spring system, for instance, is typically what you will see as a demonstration. So that forced vibration that's a sine or a cosine wave will have something called a driving frequency, which would be the frequency of that waveform. And this is a key thing that you need to talk about resonance. You need to know what the driving frequency is. And another key thing you need to know about for resonance is the natural frequency. So if you have a mass and spring system or a pendulum, if you just um, displaced it and then released it, it would oscillate with a certain time period or a certain frequency, that's the natural frequency of the system. And then what you're trying to do is force it to go at different frequencies, and that's when you get resonance happening. Okay, so that's the terminology. So let's have a look at resonance first of all. Okay, so if you plot a graph of driving frequency against the amplitude of vibration, say, of a spring or a pendulum, so as you change the frequency, so in this case, as you increase the frequency, what you notice is that when you reach a certain frequency, the amplitude of vibration suddenly, and it is really dramatically, increases. So mostly it's quite low, and then suddenly, bam, spikes up like this. And this is resonance. And what you find is when the driving frequency is equal to the natural frequency of a system, that's when you get this resonant peak here and I'm sure your teachers might show you a demonstration of this using a vibration generator and it is really quite dramatic and this is the principle behind um, there are many like myths around about opera singers shattering glasses there's an excellent Brainiac video where they get status quo I think it is to shatter a glass um, that this is what's going on it's all about resonance so let's dig into that a little bit more and look at the different regions of the graph so what we're going to do is essentially first talk about when the driving frequency is less than the resonant frequency, which is this section here. Second, we'll talk about the actual point when the driving frequency is equal to the natural frequency. And then thirdly, we'll talk about this section here. So if you supply it with a frequency greater than the natural frequency. So those are the three scenarios you have to know about. And you have to describe them in terms of what happens with the amplitude and what happens in terms of the phase difference. So... First of all, if the vibration, is, um, so what happens to the vibration if the driving frequency is less than the natural frequency? So the way to think about this is if you're trying to force it with quite a slow periodic force. And what happens is that you get a very small amplitude of uh, vibration in this case, so you're not getting a resonant peak. And the two will resonate in phase with each other. So if you think about slowly pushing a pendulum back and forth uh, the, like with your finger, they're, they're going to move together, so they're going to move in phase with each other. Whereas if you match the driving frequency and the natural frequency, what you get is this massive spike in amplitude, so you get a much larger amplitude. And what you'll see is that 
the vibration of the system, like the pendulum or the spring, is 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians out of phase with the driving frequency. So we get a difference between them, and there's uh, many things you can find online to explain why that's the case. It's not something you need to know, but it is very interesting to have a look at. There's some nice analogies with swings to help you with that one. So that's when they're matched. If the driving frequency is much greater than the natural frequency, essentially you're trying to force the system to go faster than it wants to go. Um, so what happens is actually you get a smaller amplitude again, so you're not at resonance, but the oscillation of the system is actually completely antiphase or out of phase with the driving frequency because you're trying to for force it to go faster than it wants to. Um, so those are the three key areas and you do need to be able to describe each of these scenarios. There are frequent questions that come up asking about these, so you need to make sure you know those. Okay, so let's move on and talk a bit about damping. So as I said before, damping is essentially when you're transferring energy out of the system by doing work against forces. And what you would see if you plot an amplitude against time graph is what, like on the right here, so what you can see is the amplitude is decreasing over time and the amp amplitude essentially is a measurement of how much energy there is in your system um, but you'll notice the time period stays exactly the same because time period is independent of the amplitude. Okay so as I was saying what you can see here is that you're doing work against a damping force or resistive force or resist like air resistance something like that. So the mechanical energy in your system or if you think about it, when it's at the amplitude, that's all potential energy, is going to be decreasing over time, and it's transferred to thermal energy, because that's what friction does. It transfers useful energy into heat. So that's just damping in general. Now, there's four kinds of damping you need to know about. Heavy damping, light damping, critical damping, and over damping. So those are the four scenarios. And in each case here, I've plotted the graph of... Uh, free vibration just for comparison. So if we look here, so your free, free vibration is this blue one here. You can see the amplitude stays the same and it's just continuing to oscillate. It's not transferring energy to the surroundings. The light damped is this red one here. So you can see the amplitude is slowly decreasing over time. As the heavy damping one, you can see the amplitude is decreasing much faster. So essentially you're doing much more work against resistive forces each time. Uh, so you're very quickly heading back towards the zero amplitude or the equilibrium position in these ones. So light damping is a slow decrease in amplitude, heavy damping quicker decrease in amplitude. So that's comparing those two. Then we've got these other two which uh, you come across much more in different applications of this, and that's critical damping and over damping. So critical damping, first of all, is this red one here, and essentially what that means is it's the fastest time to go straight back to zero. So you can see here, it's been displaced, it goes back to zero, but doesn't oscillate anymore about that point. So this is something you'd use in a car suspension because you don't want your car to be bouncing around um, and it indicate if your car is bouncing around it kind of indicates you've actually got a problem with your suspension. So what you've got here is it's been displaced say by a speed bump or a bump in the road something and it's gone straight back to, to zero displacement as fast as possible. That's critical damping. But if you excessively damp it, so you go beyond critical damping, it actually takes a long time to get back to the zero displacement position because there's a, such a big force acting against the motion that it makes it tricky. So think about trying to swing a pendulum in some treacle or honey or something. It will take a long time to get back to your equilibrium position here. So those are your four cases of damping, and I guess five if you think about the free vibration, and you need to know about all of those and be able to describe each of those in terms of using key terminology, so talking about energy and work done, that kind of thing. So the last thing we're going to look about in this video is actually how damping affects the resonance graph. And it's essentially, the, the impact of it is it decreases the amplitude at all points on your graph. So if we can if we go down here, so essentially we're increasing damping, so at every frequency we can see the amplitude is decreased. But by far the biggest impact is on this resonance peak here. So if you increase the damping on a system, you can actually 
help it resist the effects of resonance. Um, so thinking about designing buildings for earthquakes, stuff like that, this principle is incredibly useful because one of the most dangerous things to happen is a building gets shaken at its resonance frequency or its natural frequency, sorry, and resonance occurs, which this is when you get massive destruction in an earthquake. So if you can somehow damp your building, which they do in areas where earthquakes are common, you can actually reduce the impact of this and potentially save your building from shaking itself apart or your bridge from becoming damaged. So this is very useful when you're designing systems to be resistant to um, forced vibrations. Okay, so that concludes this video on damping and resonance. There's a lot of content in this particular topic, and this is stuff you just have to like, remember and know and be able to describe very well, but um, it's well worth investing the time in. This sort of thing crops up quite a lot in the advanced mechanics stuff.